back. Perhaps it's time for a change of pace. We've taken some time to look at the various maps of the world and the layout that some of us think might be credible is the circular layout. It's generically referred to as an azimuthal equidistant projection. And while it still has some questions, it seems to be the best that we can find for the moment. For some reason, this map really does seem to annoy some people. And while I'm inclined to think that it serves some purpose, I also think it might be keeping us from making further progress. Most of us can find our way around this map. The land masses that it shows certainly seem to exist, but in the absence of further evidence that can accurately place them in relation to each other, perhaps we should let them sink into the oceans for now and look a little further afield. I'll leave Antarctica there for the time being, so that none of us go falling off the edge. There may well be land beyond there, but I've seen no credible evidence. And for me to offer an opinion would be nothing more than idle speculation. So I'll leave it there for now. We do have some reasonable grounds to believe that at least this much of the Earth does exist. And back in episode 10, I showed that it has roughly the same surface area as the globe. So it might be a good place to start. A blank canvas, if you like. With a surface area of 196 million square miles, and in the absence of any recognisable land masses, we need some means to reference things. So try this for size. For those who still think we live in a little ball, you may be familiar with the notion that a typical globe has an axis that runs through the middle from the North Pole, traditionally at the top, to the South Pole at the bottom, while a flat disk has the North Pole at the middle running to the south around the edge. All circles can be divided into 360 degrees. Take a look at any protractor, you'll see that they're all the same. A typical globe has 36 longitude lines, 10 degrees apart, running from the North Pole to the South Pole. And the disk maps show the same information, but generally stick with using 24 of them placed 15 degrees apart. These lines are imaginary, but world navigation seems to agree that the line that runs through Greenwich and Paris is accepted worldwide as being the start point or prime meridian. But for our purposes, the prime meridian is academic. You can start anywhere you choose. There is another imaginary line called the equator that runs around the middle of the globe. On the disc, it follows a midline between the North Pole and the edge. Both models seem to agree that the equator is roughly the same length, about 25,000 miles. Running parallel to the equator, there are also imaginary lines called latitude lines running east and west around the globe. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just stick with the lines that are 30 degrees and 60 degrees on each side of the equator. On the disc, the same lines form concentric circles around the North Pole. Any point on the Earth can be shown by providing a longitude coordinate and a latitude coordinate. The point being where the two lines meet. So we now have a reference system. But for our purposes here, all I need are latitude lines. Any latitude on either model will show you how far you are from the North Pole. And at this moment, that's all we need even for those of you who still think we live on a little ball. By a couple of clicks with your mouse, you could find your own latitude anywhere in the world. Latitude lines serve as well as a reference because they're a navigation tool based on the lights in the sky. Back in episode 11, I show that the lights in the sky have been used by navigators for many centuries. Indeed, they were used on the oceans right up until the middle of the 18th century when reliable clocks began to develop. While many modern navigators now rely on GPS, it's notable that a number of the naval institutions around the world have returned to teaching celestial navigation. So let's come see what all the fuss is about. 
The word planisphere simply means a flat map of a spherical surface. The flat circular map of the world has been wrapped around a ball to provide a model for the globe. And in the same way that the flat circular map of the world can be shown as a ball, so too can the skies. This is an astronomical planisphere. It's a flat map of the sky above the Earth. To the casual observer, the light in the sky is something that most of us take for granted. Barring bad weather and chemtrails, we can see them every night and don't generally pay them much attention. If you're like me, the first time this caught your attention, you went rushing to the internet to see exactly which stars you were looking at and were probably overwhelmed by the whiz-bang websites that shows a host of fast-moving animations and complicated star maps that leave us with more questions than answers. So let's put the brakes on and take a closer look. For most of us, this will be a fairly new subject, so I invite you to listen to my assertions and I'll put some plans at the end for those of you who'd like to try this for yourselves. I'll show you the plans to make your own planisphere. While the astronomical priests of the world would have us believe that the lights in the sky are some mystical subject from among the dark arts, astronomy is remarkably simple, but not to be confused with astrology that seeks to confer special powers on the lights in the sky that are understood by a chosen few who charge us lots of money to tell you what they mean. Thank you, but we'll stick with what we can see for now. An astronomical planisphere comprises two disks that are riveted together so that one of them rotates over the other. The top disk is transparent to provide a window called a ground mask through which you can see part of the sky above. The disk underneath is called a star map or sky map and shows the lights in the sky. The manufacturer of this particular planisphere, Philips, have been producing these things for well over a century, so we can be reasonably content that their information is accurate. Unfortunately, I'm one of those people who has an irresistible urge to find out how things work. So, once I got my hands on this thing, my first instinct was to pull it apart. But those nice people at Philips went one better and made a glow-in-the-dark version. It seems like a good idea, but it's not as practical as one might think. The window tends to look rather busy, but it does have one advantage, that I can pull the whole ground mask off and see what's underneath. Cool, eh? With the ground mask removed, you can see most of the sky in one go, but let's not anticipate developments. Any half decent astronomical planisphere will look like this and contains the same essential elements. The bottom layer, the star map, shows the months of the year around the edge, and inside of that it shows the days of each month. Depending on the manufacturer, some show each day of the month and some show them in two or three day intervals to keep the layout simple. The difference matters little. Printed on the top layer, the ground mask, are the 24 hours of the solar day and a window that allows you to see parts of the sky through a circular window that shows the limits of your horizon. Although you can't really see it here, there's a faint blue cross at the middle of the circle to show you, the observer, in the middle. I'll mark it here with a red dot to make it a bit clearer. A closer look will show that the cardinal compass directions, north, east, south and west, are also shown, but the more observant among you will notice that they run in the opposite direction to a standard compass rose. That's because it's showing what the sky looks like above your head. The first thing that most people realise is when they see something like this is that the sky is humongous. We only see about one quarter of the total sky, and ground masks are produced to show the sky at a particular latitude. This one is made to show the sky above the 51 degree latitude line anywhere around the world, but it's sufficient to show the sky for a good 80 degree radius around that point, and shows the sky above Northern Europe, North America and Canada. 
So let's see what's up there. If you're standing on the earth anywhere along the 50 degree latitude line and look up, this is the sky above your head. You're the dot in the middle of the ground mask and this is your horizon. If you look at the times of day around the edge and rotate the time of day to match the date, it will show you the sky immediately above your head. This far north, we can see Polaris at the centre. If we pick January 21st for a moment at 6pm, this shows the stars above your head. And as the evening rolls on, and by the hour, you'll see that the sky changes. So I have a question for you. The stars above your head are constantly rotating. So, is it the Earth that's moving, or the sky? For many centuries, people accepted that the sky moves above their head, until the 17th century when the theories of Copernicus and Galileo set the whole thing spinning and tossed it into outer space. Many flat earthers seem content to accept that it is the sky that moves, and that the Earth is indeed stationary. So if we keep the ground mask still, and let the sky revolve, you'll see that as January the 21st moves along by the hour, the sky rotates above your head. The effect is exactly the same. You're standing still and the sky rotates above you. So let's look closer. The stars that you can see here are called background stars and they all rotate from east to west around Polaris. Hour by hour, the sky rotates above you. In fact, if we pick one star for a moment, I'll use Betelgeuse and let the day progress, you'll see that it approaches from the east, it crosses the sky and disappears beyond your horizon to the west. As the sky continues to rotate, it eventually goes all the way around and reappears on your eastern horizon the next day. In fact, it takes the sky 23 hours 56 minutes and 4 seconds to make one full rotation. It's called a sidereal day, and everything in the sky rotates around Polaris. The horizon is essentially the limit of our eyesight in all directions, and seems to have nothing to do with us living on a little ball. So let's take a look behind the scenes. If I remove the ground mask completely, you'll see a map of the sky. It looks a little daunting at first, lots of dots, but there are really only two things in the sky with which we should concern ourselves, so let's try and simplify things. What's shown here are the background stars. They are the stars that rotate around Polaris every day above your head. If you remember that we are looking upwards, all the stars are rotating anti-clockwise around Polaris. A closer look will show that in the same way that the Earth can be divided up with latitude and longitude lines, so too can the skies. The sky has an equator called the celestial equator, just like the Earth. But a closer look will show that the celestial equator is aligned perfectly with the equator below, and so too are the 30 and 60 degree latitude lines. So this map shows us the stars from the North Pole all the way out to the 60 degree line just inside the Antarctic Circle. As the sky rotates, the stars all rotate in the same direction. Yes, even south of the equator. The constellations in the sky are little more than dot to dot pictures that man has created to link the stars in the sky to each other. Early Arabic astronomers established some of the first constellations, and the Greeks added a few more to make those with which most of us are now familiar. I'm not too concerned here with most of the constellations in the sky, except to return to a comment I made earlier, that there are two things in the sky that we can use as points of reference. There's the celestial equator, and against the background stars, there's another imaginary circle called the ecliptic. And while the circle itself is imaginary, it provides us with another reference. The ecliptic has been populated with the signs of the zodiac, pictures created from the background stars. 
they are nothing more than constellations that are part of the entire background. Beginning with Aries, they run to Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces. The ecliptic will give us something to work with in a moment, but let me draw your attention to the constellation that's been formed at the centre of the ecliptic. It's Draco, the dragon. And while I don't hold with the stars having any control over our lives, it's worth noting that the dragon is mentioned in the Bible, and it doesn't come with glowing references. The ecliptic forms a circle around the constellation of Draco that's off-center compared to Polaris. So while everything rotates around Polaris, the ecliptic itself is centered above the Arctic Circle, a shade over 66 degrees from the equator. So let's go look at the stars. I showed you a moment ago that the background stars make one full rotation in 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds. A sidereal day, but man in his wisdom has elected to adopt a 24 hour day based on the position of the sun instead. It doesn't seem like a tremendous difference, but it does create a number of noticeable effects. If we use Betelgeuse again for a moment, it takes 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds to make one full rotation, so in 24 hours it makes a little over one full circuit. In fact, each point in the sky travels about 361 degrees in 24 hours. So if I go out and look at the stars at exactly the same time each night, I'll see them gradually drift west night by night. If I watch for a whole year, the day by day drift will end up back where it started at the same time of night and the whole cycle repeats again. Of course, the big question the most flat earthers struggle with is the sun, so let's take a look. We tend to look at the sun from the ground, and so we use the ground as our frame of reference, but suppose we look at it in another way. Let's look at it against the background of stars. The sun moves along the ecliptic, in fact it takes a year to travel around the ecliptic, so let's remove the ground mask and see what's under the hood. The location of the sun against the background stars is found by laying a straight edge from the centre of the sky to the date we're looking at it. The sun takes one year to travel around the ecliptic, so if all circles can be divided into 360 degrees, the sun travels about one degree per day along the ecliptic. If you look a little closer, you see that the ecliptic is the same size as the celestial equator, and the celestial equator is the same size as the surface equator, about 25,000 miles. So the sun travels about 70 miles along the ecliptic each day. So what does all this look like from the ground? If we use December 22nd for a moment, and lay a straight edge to that date, we'll see that the sun is just passing into Sagittarius. But remember that while the sun moves one degree per day along the ecliptic, the whole sky rotates 361 degrees around Polaris. So the net effect is that the sun describes this path over the surface of the Earth. Flat Earthers generally know that except in North Pole, we don't see the sun up there for 24 hours. So what does it look like from the ground? If I replace the ground mask and rotate it until the sun is right on the eastern horizon, you'll see that on December 22nd, it's there at 8 a.m. sunrise. Over the day, remember that the whole sky rotates east to west around Polaris. So you'll see the sun travel from the eastern horizon to the western horizon arriving there just before 4pm, sunset. At that point it's beyond the limits of our eyesight to see, and as the light fades you'll see the stars become visible again. I'm not too concerned here with the twilight hours, as they seem to do little more than help fudge the length of the day to support the spinning ball illusion. 
If I remove the ground mask again, but leave the horizon line there for reference, we get the best of both worlds and can take a closer look at the ecliptic. Looking upwards as the year progresses, the sun moves one degree per day clockwise around the ecliptic, so that by the middle of March it's in the constellation of Pisces. If we take March 21st, you'll see that it crosses the eastern horizon at about 6am, and the whole sky rotates that day, taking the sun across the sky to pass the western horizon about 6pm for sunset. By the middle of June, the sun is just entering the constellation of Gemini, and from the ground you'll see that it crosses your eastern horizon at about 4am. The sky rotates around Polaris, and the sun crosses the sky to the western horizon, arriving there about 8pm. We are now at the height of summer north of the equator, and the path across the sky is over the Tropic of Cancer, the summer solstice. By the middle of September, the sun has progressed even further around the ecliptic, and is now entering the constellation Virgo, where it will cross the eastern horizon at about 6am, and crosses the sky to the western horizon, at about 6 p.m. By the end of the year, the sun is back where it started, heading into the constellation of Sagittarius, with sunrise at 8 a.m. and passing through the sky above the Tropic of Capricorn. It provides summer again south of the equator. So let's recap the story so far. North of the equator from the middle of winter, the sun crosses your eastern horizon and takes this path through the sky above the Tropic of Capricorn to your western horizon. In the spring, it crosses your eastern horizon and takes this path through the sky above the equator and sets in the west. By the summer, north of the equator, the sun crosses your eastern horizon to pass over the Tropic of Cancer during the day, before setting at the western horizon. It then continues to head away from Polaris through the autumn equinox, and finally, by the middle of the northern winter, it's back where it started, and rises above the Tropic of Capricorn, one year from where we began. It seems like a fairly credible reason for the change of seasons during the year, so I'd like to add one or two extras to this for people to think on until next time. There's no need here for me to complicate things any further than to show where the sun is at the equinoxes and solstices. I'm sure you're now able to work out where the sun is as it passes from one to the next as the year progresses, so I'd like to take one more look behind the scenes before I close. One subject of much argument among flat earthers is the notion that the sun needs to somehow speed up over the Tropic of Capricorn. I would suggest that there's no need for it to do so. The sun travels around the ecliptic at a steady speed of about one degree, about 70 miles per day. Additionally, the whole sky rotates once in 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds. The fact that the Sun appears to cover a longer path over the Tropic of Capricorn is nothing more than a consequence of us measuring its path by ground speed. Its speed in the sky looks pretty constant from here. So, in closing, I appreciate that for most of us, this subject is still fairly new and takes a slightly different approach to a problem with which we've wrestled for some time. As such, it's probably a good place to finish for the moment and provide people with some time to digest these things before we move on to take a closer look at the moon and the wandering stars that we colloquially call the planets. And finally, I'd like to provide a caveat an astronomical planisphere is an observation tool. I have no doubt that the people who make these things think we live on a little ball, but I think the Earth is flat, and this thing seems to show me exactly what I can see in the sky. So let me preempt the naysayers, who will say that planispheres for the Southern Hemisphere show something different. Let me counter it only with an assertion that they appear to show exactly the same thing. We appear to be looking at the same sky, with the same stars, going in the same direction. 
But that's your decision to make. You'll recall that at the start of this episode, I said that I'd show you the plans for a planosphere so that you could make one for yourselves and take a closer look. The Canadian National Research Council have produced a Northern Hemisphere planosphere for anyone to download and make. If you go to their website, there's a link to a PDF that you can print out on two sheets of paper and make a planosphere for yourself. I'll put the link in the description box below. When you print the document, it will give you two pages that look like this. Cut out the circular star map and cut out the frame for the ground mask. You'll also need to cut out the circle inside the horizon to create the ground mask itself. Once they're cut out, fold the flaps along the dotted lines and slide the star map into the frame. I found it made things easier to then tape the whole thing by the edges to a sheet of card that allowed me to hold the card while I rotate the star map. There, you're ready to go. On the basis that you can only see the stars at night, this particular model shows the hours between 6pm and 6am, but it's a good place to start and take a look at the sky for yourself. Simply align the date with the time of day and it will show you which constellations are above you. Remember, you're standing at the centre of the ground mask. As the evening progresses, you'll see all the stars rotating from east to west across the sky, and it'll give you a feel for what's going on up there. Next time, we'll take another look at the sun, and we'll also take a look at the moon and the wandering stars. In the meantime, take a look for yourself. Thank you for listening.